بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to this episode in the series Al Amin Peace Building in the Life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam I am your host Muhammad Nuruddin Lemu and with me to discuss a number of issues today related to magnanimity especially when it comes to interfaith relations our relations with people of other faiths uh, with me to discuss these are two of our distinguished uh, facilitators trainers and volunteers with the Dawa Institute Dr Sadiq Oyas- uh, Oyasanya and Professor Awal Magashi you are both most welcome jazakumullah khairan and assalamu alaikum alhamdulillah jazakumullah khairan I'd like to start with you, uh, Oyesanya, on the subject of interfaith relations. Um, we always have one reason or the other within a community for which somebody um, decides to hurt others or hurt us. Um, in the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi we have come across quite a number of cases where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi showed magnanimity and forgiveness to people of other faiths, Ahl al-Kitab, people of earlier revelations who belong to the category of, say, Jews and Christians, for example, but also to Mushrikun, polytheists, who on, an, on the ideological spectrum are further down uh, in the opposite direction from Muslims, uh, if you will. And what we find is cases where the Prophet showed the same magnanimity he did to Ahl al-Kitab who tried to hurt him, we find something similar to polytheists. In other words, this magnanimity is not tied to which particular religion you belong to, but the fact that you are a human being and viewing it as you made a mistake and forgiveness would probably reduce the chance of your repeating that mistake. Could you share with us some cases, and these are the main things I'd like us to discuss today, but could you share cases that show this same magnanimity that we have discussed in some of our previous episodes? Alhamdulillahi wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa mawala. It's my honor once again to be on this program I will pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to continue to guide and provide for the Dawah Institute. Amen. We have, like you said, quite a number of cases like that in history, but the very important one I would like to share with our audience this afternoon has to do with the conquest of Mecca. First and foremost, what happened? What was the background to this conquest? What and what were the situations or the conditions of the Muslims and the Prophet in particular before the conquest of Mecca? And when eventually the, Mo- the Muslims conquered Mecca, what was the disposition of the Prophet وسلم, to those he met in Mecca, considering the fact that mm. that was the town he was born and of course he was also driven away from that town. So I would like to present some background to that. It is an undenying fact that before the Prophet ﷺ migrated from Mecca to Medina, Mm. Mecca as a city, as a community, was totally hostile to the Prophet in particular and the Muslims in general. Mm. That's the first point we need to understand. Now the second thing is that not only that hostility came from the people of Mecca to the Prophet, you know, there was even an attempt to terminate his life, to take his life, as we have that, you know, in record. Uh, to such an extent that Prophet at some point had to, you know, inform, urge some Muslims of, of that period to migrate from Mecca to Abyssinia, among other waves of migration before the Prophet eventually migrated from Mecca to Medina. So this is the second uh, point we need to understand. And the second, the third point is also to underscore the fact that the Meccan people, mm-hmm. the Quraysh in particular, adopted a number of methods to inflict pains, to persecute, and uh, to punish 
uh, those who chose to profess al Islam, mm -hmm. among which included, you know, social boycott of the Banu Hashim and by extension the, the companions of the Prophet. So that was the first one. And uh, the second one was also um, torture of various degrees and various categories, you know, which you know, were actually meted out to co the companions, most importantly, the vulnerable, the weak ones mm -hmm. among the, com in the companions of the Prophet. And at the height of it was the fact that at some point, two historical events happened mm -hmm. that shaped the entire discussion, and that was the death of two of the backers of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in time you know I'm, I'm talking i'm talking about the the, the wife of the prophet khadija bin khuwailid you know, who died and of course the uncle of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam these mm -hmm. were two supporters great supporters of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mm -hmm. and their death actually um, overwhelmed at some point the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so that's the point we need to also take into consideration and of course at some point the Meccan people, the Quraysh, eventually decided to say enough is enough to the Prophet and that the Prophet should be assassinated, should mm -hmm. be killed. And therefore, that assassination plot was commissioned by the Quraysh tribe and it was almost executed when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, directed, instructed the Prophet to leave Mecca for Medina. So that point is also very significant and not only that a, you know a number of companions of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam were earlier before that migration you know assassinated i'm talking about companions like amar bin yasser mm -hmm. uh, I'm, 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 I'm also referring to sumaya um, musa abun umayr among other companions who were killed so that level or that rate or that severity of hostility mm -hmm. coming from the Quraysh mm -hmm. to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam eventually made the prophet to leave mecca for medina when the prophet therefore came to mecca after several years you know several years later and eventually he had the might he had the power to even do and undo what did the prophet decide to do the prophet chose to forgive those who had wanted to kill him those who had persecuted him those who had dehumanized him you know of all sort and how did we come about this? We, you know, in, in a number of sources of Islam actually reported this case. Mm -hmm. You know, in, I'm referring to Al Bayhaki. Mm -hmm. I'm referring to Sunan uh, of Imam Ahmad bin Ambali. Mm -hmm. I'm also referring to Ibn Kathir in his Al Bidaya mm -hmm. Nihaya reported this case. And very instructively is the Hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, which um, from where we got what the Prophet indeed said when eventually the muslims conquered mecca the prophet those who had not embraced islam gathered at the mosque at the mosque at, at the kaaba mm -hmm. and the prophet asked, you know actually addressed them that and they more or less sought from the prophet sallallahu what would you like to do to us mm -hmm. you know considering what they had done to the prophet sallallahu and the prophet said you can all go free. free you can all go free so that statement alone was the peak was the height of the demonstration of the prophet of the level of the highest level of magnanimity those who had once been your avowed enemy mm -hmm. and you deciding to say i will let go of all you had done to me in the past mm -hmm. and i've said this all this historical event culminating into the conquest of mecca and eventually the magnanimity shown by the Prophet ﷺ. We have a number of verses in the Quran also drawing our attention to what actually happened and what the Prophet indeed did later. Mm -hmm. Instructively, if you check Quran chapter 42, um, verse 24, mm -hmm. where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in particular referred to that magnanimity, Allah said that we cannot compare, you know, evil and good and when there is evil and when there is good good ensure that you repel evil with good and not evil with evil mm -hmm. and that is exactly what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam demonstrated not only that the revelation came to to do that we also have them in historical records mm -hmm. you know to demonstrate i mean to show us i mean to uh, indicate 
that not only that we had the revelation, but, but the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also supported what Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala mm. had said. This is, this is very interesting and useful. Um, the, the kind of pain that the Prophet was caused mm -hmm. and the early Muslims had to go through uh, and at the end of the day they were forgiven. Uh, Dr. Magashi, what would you Yeah, say? in addition to that, uh, going back to the bath he quoted, uh, at the end of the bath, Allah is saying, Haiza lazi bayna ka bayna hum adawatan ka anna hu walin hamim. So by failing, uh, evil was good. In doing so, those who are enemy to you, who are your enemy, you turn them into your closest friends. Mm. So then in another verse, Allah is saying, Khuzil af wamru bil ma'aruf wa ar anil jahili. Then show forgiveness and enjoying good. So this uh, Quranic verses taught the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam this kind of benevolence he has shown to the fearful that have awfully show the highest uh, hostility of highest order to him. Far from that also, uh, in another bath, we can remember that the Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam also the same situation that his brothers who have also even nearly killed him. Later on when Allah, when, when he become uh, a leader in the Egypt uh, as a treasurer, so they met him. They were expecting him to punish them. But he said, La tasriba alaykum liyum. La tasriba alaykum liyum. There is no reproach on you. So he forgave them. And uh, from there also, we remember in the day of the conquest of Mecca, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam equally echoed the same, the same thing that uh, Isa Ali, um, Prophet Yusuf Alaihi Salam has said to his brother which is showing the high magnanimity of uh, highest order of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, in the Hadith from the Hadith also, we can remember that the Tirmizi reported uh, as Aisha saying that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, truly it's better that a leader err in forgiving than the err in punishing. Which means uh, the Prophet as a leader of course, he forgive them despite the fact the problem he had with them is better than to punish them. Because by punishing them, he's drawing them away, far away from him. By forgiving them, he's uh, creating a, a, a kind of relationship that may end up embracing the Islam and accepting him as a, one of them. And Sahih Muslim also, Abu Huraira uh, reported, that uh, I have not been said, the Prophet said, I have not been said to invoke cause, but I have been said as a mercy to mankind. Yes. Jazakallah mm -hmm. um, So what we see from, you know, both of your uh, contributions, firstly, the idea um, of somebody in power mm -hmm. um, who has the full strength mm -hmm. and justification to go for justice, mm. or what you would describe as equitable retribution. Mm. This was somebody whose family members were killed, um, friends and companions persecuted, he himself attempts on his life. Um, but eventually, uh, during what some call the conquest of Mecca, but it was really you know, difficult to use the word conquest, uh, because what had happened was that the Meccans had a treaty during Hudaybiyah with the Muslims that they were going to live in peace with each other. Um, but part of the understanding of the treaty is you don't attack people who are in a treaty with me, just as I don't attack people who are in a treaty with you. Uh, but the Meccans attacked the Banu Khuzar uh, and killed some people. And Banu Khuzawa in a peace treaty with Muslims, and that put an obligation on Muslims to therefore mm. uh, attack Makkah. And they came ready, uh, but there was no fighting uh, in the real sense. 
And Alhamdulillah, it ended up with what some may call a peaceful conquest. Mm. Uh, but again, even though it was the Quraysh that broke the treaty, they weren't punished for having broken that treaty. Yeah. Um, uh, they weren't punished for past atrocities. Uh, we see this uh, happening again and again. So we see it on a huge scale uh, this time where it's the atrocities of both the leadership and a lot of the followership of Makkah. Mm. What lessons would you derive from this instance? And we'll look at others, but at least from the conquest of Makkah, mm. what are the implications of how the Prophet Sallallahu behaved to everyday life of Muslim leaders today? Alhamdulillah, there are a lot of lessons we can draw out of it. The kindness the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam shows to the polyacists who have mistreated uh, him, uh, attempted to assassinate him and uh, inflict serious pain onto his companions and the others and expel them from their homes. So in showing that uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, is uh, the great leader. He's a great leader uh, was of emulation. And another thing, forgiveness even with justice. Uh, in the case of the conquest of Mecca, there is all justification to punish them. But he didn't. He preferred to forgive them than to punish them, even though he has all the justification. And um, the case of uh, counter-argument held by some of the Muslim in power that uh, a leader should be hushed so that he can uh, be respected and be pair of is not correct because what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi demonstrated has proved the opposite. So these are some of the lessons inshallah you can learn from it. Mm -hmm. What would you add? Mm -hmm. My very first important implication which could infer from this case uh, would be in the angle of Islamic criminal justice. Mm -hmm. We are in the Hadith of Aisha as reported by Al-Imam Al-Tirmidhi that Prof uh, made reference to, mm. uh, eventually became a guiding principle for Islamic criminal justice that it's, it's better for the state, uh, mm. you know, um, the leadership, the government to, to pardon a suspected an alleged criminal than just to punish, you know, an innocent, innocent person. So this is a case of, you know, um, an inference which eventually became a guiding principle for Islamic criminal law. So that is the first one. And the second one is that um, the incident mm. of this peaceful conquest, conquest. of Mecca, mm. it's, it's, we can also get from that that at all times, whether we are in the position of authority or not, we should always be lenient, not only to Muslims, but also to non-Muslims. And we will recall that in, in the literature of Islam, Non-Muslims are broadly classified into Ahlul Kitab mm. and those who are non ahlul Kitab. And therefore, our choice of non-Muslims should not be restricted to only ahlul Kitab. Mm. Both considering the fact that even the, the Quraysh, members of the Quraysh tribe were predominantly, you know, polytheist. And therefore, the Prophet also extended that gesture of magnanimity, mm. of kindness, and, uh, and of course, tolerance of a whole lot of things they had done. And to inflict pains on on him, so that is another point we need to understand. So, in the course of even dispensing justice, mm. we have to be very lenient as an individual, and of course as a group or as a state. So that's another point we need to understand. We should also take from this that the, that's why the fact that the courage truly killed a lot of people, a lot of Muslims. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never demanded compensation mm -hmm. for damages from them. So that is also an high, considering the fact that in Islam, Allah had said previously that the, 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 the punishment for killing, deliberate or unjustifiable mm -hmm. killing, killing, is what you, you should be killed or you eventually, or, or if it is, an, um, what do we call it, if it is um, unjustifiable killing or a mistaken killing rather, it should be, or accidental killing, it should be what, payment of dhiyya. Yeah. But the Prophet never demanded any, any of the any of this from the Quraysh. So that mm. is also a message for us as Muslims. Mm. So these are the few points, a few uh, inferences or implications mm. that we could draw 
from the case of the peaceful conquest of Mecca. Mm. So what we find, therefore, is what today we call the equivalence to, or something equivalent to seeking peace and reconciliation. Um, in South Africa, after the apartheid, in Rwanda, after the genocide, a uh, couple of other places, uh, what the government actually found was if you are going to say, let's go with justice, mm. these cases will carry on for decades um, and it'll it'll hurt a lot of people. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes what is actually the most practical thing to do for a nation to deal with its pain, get closure and be able to move forward is to actually see how forgiveness uh, can take place, exactly. how reconciliation uh, can take place. Um, and I'd like us to, you know, eventually see how we can apply these principles. But I'd like to move on to another hmm. instance uh, at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a period that he recalled as one of his, you know, um, most, uh, a period of sorrow uh, hmm. that really overwhelmed him. And it was his treatment in Ta'if uh, during the Meccan period before the Hijra when he went to invite them uh, to Islam and the kind of treatment he got there. Mm. Could you tell us exactly what happened in Taif? Thank you, sir. Um, in Taif, you have actually laid the background. Uh, let me just add a point mm -hmm. to that. The what was responsible for that period of sorrow for the Prophet? It was because mainly Khadija bint Khawailid his wife and Abu Talib, his uncle, died the same year. Mm. And coupled with the fact that the rate or the level or the severity of persecution or hostility coming from the Quraysh tribe, you know, the Prophet and the, and, and the early Muslims could not bear those sufferings again. Okay. And therefore, options kept coming to the Prophet as to what would be the fate of the nascent Islam at that time. Mm -hmm. And having you know, considering the fact that the Muslims had once migrated from um, Mecca to, to, to Abyssinia. Mm -hmm. And now Ta'if happened to be another fertile area mm -hmm. where the Prophet Islam thought he could explore further, you know, calling the people to, to Islam. And therefore, on the 10th year of the mission, the Prophet set out with Zaid bin al-Arif mm -hmm. to Ta'if. And the mission mainly was to preach al-Islam mm. to the people of Taif. The Prophet was in Taif for 10 days. And within those 10 days, the Prophet met with the nobles, all people of different backgrounds, socioeconomic backgrounds. The Prophet mm. met with them mm. in order to, if we mm. could use the modern language, market mm. Islam to them. In other words, to preach the mission preach the to mission. them. But they rejected. And having rejected that, rejection by the nobles, and other categories of people in mm -hmm. Taif okay. was not the, the most painful part to the Prophet Sallallahu But because after the 10th day, the Prophet chose to return to Mecca. Mecca. But on his way, alongside, you know, um, Zaid bin Harith, you know, they were attacked. The Prophet was attacked alongside Zaid by the youth of the people of Taif. And not only that, they were physically attacked, they inflicted pains to the point that historians in Islam and historiographers, and of course we have these also in the books of Hadith, you know, reported that the prof Prophet was bleeding. Mm -hmm. And okay. that bleeding, and considering the fact that the people of Taif did not even embrace Islam, did not accept the mission from him. And also, owing to the fact that deaths of Khadija and Abu Talib were still Mm -hmm. In the memory of the Prophet, mm -hmm. and coupled with the fact that the persecution had not stopped, all this overwhelmed the Prophet to such an extent that he had to retire to a tree. So he was more or less ruminating on what would be the way forward when Angel Jibril appeared before, you know, came to him, you know, explained that Allah had commissioned the angel of mountains, you know, to seek what would be the way forward. Mm -hmm. See what the we see what Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam did. He had all he could. He had all all he took to ensure that justice for him and Zaid would be would actually be done. Mm -hmm. But the Prophet chose to even forgive. 
And what did the prophet tell? I mean, the, 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 the angel in charge of the mountains. He told the angel that perhaps Allah would raise from among the people of Toy those who would want accept Islam and also believe in Allah. That was exactly the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In spite of the hostility, in spite of the persecution, in spite of the infliction of pains on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And some sco modern scholars will say that perhaps account for why Ta'if is one of the beautiful places, you know, for Muslims and for Islam to thrive, you know, in the world today. So this was what actually happened to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Zaid bin Haris when they left Mecca for Taif. This is very interesting. Mashallah. So here we Mashallah. find the Prophet looking for refuge, mm -hmm. looking for a place that mm -hmm. could be another center of Islam. Um, not just they rejected the message, but they decided to also persecute. persecute. You know, it, mm -hmm. it was a very clear message mm -hmm. of don't come back mm -hmm. and we don't want to have anything to do with you. Um, but we find when Allah sends an angel that gives the option of retaliation, retaliation. Uh, the prophet in spite of the fact that that taif is closed mm. uh, still remains hopeful that well maybe his children uh, the children of taif the youth among them are those who will come to love allah and worship allah exactly. and if i recall in the hadith the prophet sallallahu echoing a similar statement by jesus peace be upon him mm. uh, that is quoted as jesus having said um, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing they do you know, know a similar type of statement Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying, you know, Allah, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that response of instead of you reject, mm -hmm. uh, you are disbelievers, then you should be punished. Uh, and, you know, if Allah is okay with it, I'm okay with it. Uh, but Allah giving you the option for justice and retaliation, but you thinking ahead, not even of this generation, exactly. but of the next generation. So it's very positive approach towards looking at a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, professor, what would you add regarding Yeah, I add uh, one, one of the Basra, the Wali Man Sabaro, Wagafara, in Azale Kalimi Adam al Those who forgive, those who forgive and show patience, they are only people of great minds. And what Professor Lala Sama demonstrated at the Taifa incidents, it set a model for, for leaders. That, that how you treat your your people, those people who have uh, inflicted pain in you. The way you handle them is to forgive them, even though you, you are free to punish. And in one of the hadith, Abu Dawud uh, reported that Aisha radiallahu anha said, Prophet sallallahu never retaliate when he is wrong. When somebody wrong him, he never retaliate. He choose to forgive, but they only retaliate when and the Allah's law is broken. Mm -hmm. That only what when when he retaliates, but on his own he doesn't, and he doesn't. Mm -hmm. This is interesting. Mm -hmm. um, if we could look at comments mm -hmm. by scholars mm -hmm. uh, on this issue, type of issue, mm -hmm. you know, what have scholars said about lessons from the Taif case? Uh, there are some that I think we can uh, pick ourselves, but what have those before us? Mm -hmm. um, said on this. Okay. Ibn Hajar, for instance, Ibn Hajar has uh, said in one hadith demonstrated the kind of heartedness of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam which showed the extreme patience, extreme patience when, and the perseverance when you look at what happened at the conquest of Mecca and that of Taifa. Uh, at the same time, in line with this, the verse uh, of the Quran which says, so, so by the mercy of Allah, it is because of the, by the mercy of Allah that is why you are able to to to, to I mean to live with them. But had it been you are you are harshed and arrogant, they will disband about you. So some of uh, things that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam pardoned people, and uh, most cases. When he is offended, he forgive and pardon. You see the person uh, become a, a friend. Uh, somebody was reported to have been said, I visited, I, I came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as the worst enemy, that the hatred I, I nurture in my heart. But I did not leave his place until he become the most closest friend mm. in me. 
Yeah. 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 Lessons, implication. I would like to start my inference from this case mm. by looking at the strategic thinking of the Prophet Sallallahu at that time. Prophet saw that the youth, you know, in any society mm. are the most active when it comes to an engendering mm. um, social reforms, economic transformation, you know, peace, progress, you know, religious harmony, among all the, you know, great virtues and ideals of Islam. Mm. And the Prophet saw that the youth who were responsible for the pains he suffered in Taif should not be abandoned. Mm. Yeah. And therefore, using the instrumentality of strategic thinking, which is actually um, a principle in the world today to drive where are we today? Where are we? Where are we? You know, where, right. where are we going? How, how do we move from where we are to where mm. we are going? So it was like the prophet was using that instrumentality of strategic thinking mm. that the, this set of youth must not be punished, mm. and so because they may, at the end of the day, be the most vibrant, the most active, you know, in the field of dawah. Mm. So this particular lesson is important that. Muslim societies, Muslim communities in the world today must not just abandon the youth component or the youth population of the community. Mm. So in just, you know, for us to drive, I mean, to, to engender rather, or to entrench the ideals of Islam, so we need to carry them along. We need to make use of them. So that's the first message that one can get from this particular case. And very importantly, too, is the fact that, yes, most of them we have been re-echoing, mm. reiterating the idea of tolerance, mm -hmm. magnanimity shown by the prophet, you know, and the level of um, um, the spirit of heart, mm. large heart mm. that the prophet, uh, what they call it, had, you know, and not only that he had those virtues and values, mm. but he also demonstrated them. So one thing that is also striking in this case is the fact that as Muslims, we should always find way of giving excuses to wrongdoers that possibly these were the factors responsible for what they did mm. not that at the slight of provocation at the slight of um, um you know humiliation or dehumanization mm. we want to get justice mm. we want to demand justice let's try to you know try to give them the benefit of doubt that possibly you know what was responsible you know were a b c mm. And the moment we do that, we are going to receive many, 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 many people, not only to the fold of Islam, but also into our own, you know, accepting our own you know, ideology, accepting our own philosophy, mm. and accepting our own um, uh, principles, mm. uh, you know, uh, and, and, and among other things. So these are some of the few take-homes that mm. I could infer from this case of a toy. Mm. And I think just what exactly you've said, mm. this um, youth focus, uh, very long-term thinking, um, recognizing that a lot of what's going on is because they don't know. Mm. Uh, it's about there's an ignorance problem, whether of spiritual truths, mm. whether of moral truths, um, whether of just civility, um, or the benefit this message has for these people, and that rejection should not be just viewed as okay, that's the end of it. No, but mm. to have hope. That there is always a segment of the community that we may need to approach in a different way. Maybe mm. somebody else would approach mm. them and they would accept Islam, which is what actually happened. Some of the companions uh, and eventually actually during the Ridda wars after Islam, uh, Ta'if became one of the strongest, strongest. Uh, Muslim centers uh, that resisted breaking away. So we find uh, by the time of the companions, those youth of Ta'if, ended up becoming some of the really committed Muslims uh, in the Muslim Ummah. So this forward thinking that you've uh, alluded to, and I think it's very important for communities that have gone through trauma, mm. have polarized. Uh, Muslims wanting to stay in this part of town, uh, Christians wanting to stay in that part of town, or this other community here, another community there, to honestly ask, is this what is in the best interest of the future? What could peace builders do with younger people to see how to get communities back into healthy 
lifestyles and not allow the next generation to just inherit the pains, grievances, complaints, mm. uh, tensions, anger of uh, the older generation. So the need for peace builders to also be um, forward thinking that some mm. of the people who came and burnt your churches or came and burnt your mosques no. uh, or burnt your synagogues, a lot of them are youth. But to not give up on the youth, mm. you know, a lot of them are just playing out the wills of the more quiet uh, or vocal older generation. So the need to really uh, strategize yeah. on, uh, you know, uh, finding excuses and working with youth in this area. Mm. A lot of lessons uh, we can draw from this type of uh, incidents. You see, even so, the Prophet Sallallahu was very guided to forgive the, the youth for the future. You know, each that hour, no nation can go without uh, managing and taking care of the youth because of the future of the, of the, of the nation. So you can use the same model now. Apply uh, the, the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam forgive youth who offended, who stoned him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he forgave them. Then later, on the later day, they become the vanguard of Islam. They become the supporters of Islam and become a very stronghold. Even now, a days in Saudi Arabia, I think Taifa is, 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 is uh, one of the strongest places that the Daifa... Yeah, uh, People take Islam seriously. Yeah, 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 they mm. took it seriously. So we can use it nowadays in our country, as you highlighted. Uh, a lot of crisis, religious, something due to the differences, and uh, use at the focal point, mm. which we can put our attention to see that they are not abandoned and uh, serious follow off mm. follow off what is happening what is going on also should not be uh, the youth should not be rejected as at the same time and uh, should be taken care of mm. yeah. so i think this issue of mm. and, and we see it in various forms mm. of extremism across the world mm. um, a lot of the acts a lot of the hate speech online mm -hmm. it's by young people yeah uh, but to not look at them as just perpetrators but to also look at them as victims mm. of others and potential changes mm. and that these are the same people who can actually solve the problem to a very great, great mm. extent they already are solving it's just how yeah. to support and scale up mm. um, youth's positive influence on mm. other youth um, I, I think there's a there's another point that needs to be mm. emphasized mm -hmm. from this case of toy mm. okay. Now that has to do with emotional intelligence mm. on the part of the Prophet Sallallahu Now most of the not, you see Muslims when we are confronted with, mm. you know, daring and challenging situations or difficult circumstances or conditions, we tend, we tend, or we, we, you know, most times we, you know, what we see is that we don't normally rise above our emotions. Mm. We allow our emotions to uh, impair our judgment to actually. Uh, be at the heart of our decision. So the prophet never allowed that to happen. Mm. You know, in spite of the provocation, in spite of the dehumanization, in spite mm. of that humiliation, what the prophet did was to allow his emotions and sentiments to be put aside. Mm. And therefore, what he thought was in the best interest of the ummah mm. was the decision he took at that time. Mm. And this is, again, in the context mm. of this is his saddest moment. Mm. You know, this is when things are all down, mm -hmm. when hope is difficult to see. There's mm -hmm. no light at the end of the tunnel, but mm -hmm. the belief that there will always be. Mm -hmm. That even though Ta'if has rejected him mm -hmm. and Makkah has rejected him, uh, there's no, you know, no hope in sight. Uh, but his faith that, look, I'm on a mission to spread peace mm -hmm. and a religion for humanity. Mm -hmm. And this is not viewed as some setback that you get angry about. Uh, and the perspective of looking at the same youth that have stoned you as the future. Mm -hmm. That, you know, what somebody will say, you're looking at the problem. Um, he's actually looking at the solution. Uh, exactly. And praying, exactly. Allah, you know, don't destroy them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, th this is... So what, were, what was considered to be a challenge mm -hmm. yeah. in the eyes of the prophet was considered to be an asset. An exactly. Asset. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I'd like us to move on to another case, uh, Brother Sadiq. Uh, one of Suraka bin Malik, Malik. Um, a Bedouin Arab who was 
interested in making money because the Quraysh had already put a prize, prize. of a hundred camels for whoever can get the mm. Prophet وسلم, dead or alive. Um, can you give us more insight? What exactly happened? What was this case about? So, Alhamdulillah. Alik. Um, as the name, the name is, no, is known by ma- the vast majority of historians mm. and historiographers in Islam. Why? Because the mission given to him was a special one. And therefore, historians and historiographers, even scholars of Hadith and other categories of scholars in Islam, you know, did not just take that name lightly. Suraka bin Malik was actually was among those commissioned mm. to bring the Prophet's egg Back. Mm. dead or alive. Why? Because the Quraysh tribe, uh, you know, understood that the Prophet in their language had escaped mm. from Mecca to Medina. Mm. So that was at the, high, uh, the, 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 the height of persecution and uh, the decision by the Quraysh tribe that the Prophet should be assassinated. Mm. Why? Because they could no longer, you know, take uh, and withhold. They could no longer actually uh, accommodate and the mission of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And therefore, among other people who were commissioned to look for the Prophet, mm. whether to bring him dead or alive, was Soraka Med Malik. He set out and be, being an experienced hunter, he was able to track the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam down alongside Abu Bakr, with whom the Prophet left Mecca for Medina. And having potted them, he was about to, in the modern language, apprehend them when his house, I mean his camel rather, mm. you, know, you know, was affected by a modest sound. Mm. Mm. And therefore, he was able to find his way out of the hall. Just he demanded himself. Mm. And he was uh, overwhelmed by mm. that incident because he had never experienced, possibly mm. he had never experienced that, mm. because, considering the continence mm. of Soraka. And therefore, he... He wished that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would save the day, we mm. save him from that predicament. Mm. He even attempted to bribe the Prophet, bribe in quote actually. Mm. You know, he offered that the Prophet should take over his possession should he Brilliant. actually um, um, salvage the situation. Mm. But the Prophet refused to take that. Mm. And in spite of the mission of Soraka bin Malik, the Prophet chose to even assist it. To assist rather, to mm. assist Suraka bin Malik. Mm. He prayed unto Allah and he was able um, to, to, to be saved mm. from that predicament. He, 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 he faced himself. So that in summary, what happened was Suraka was commissioned to exterminate the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But he was stuck by another condition mm. that the person he was commissioned to assassinate was actually the savior. Mm. Of Soraka in that difficult situation. So mm-hmm. that that was just um, mm-hmm. the summary of the event, culminating into you know that incident of mm-hmm. Soraka between the, uh, the Prophet and Soraka bin Malik. And exactly the instruction from the Quran. Mm-hmm. And uh, when Soraka uh, miraculously escaped from the the, the, the that predicament of uh, being stuck in into the into the sun. Yeah. Then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi told him, "What will you say if you put the the crown of the kisra on your head?" You see, somebody who was escaping from the enemy, who was running away from the enemy, and now he's talking of the the greatest king in the world. That is a kasra, kasra of fashion, fashion, just super power, just like to say America or China or something like that. How can you start talking of uh, having the the crown of this? So Sraka was so astonished and he promised to, if he released him, he promised not to allow anybody to follow follow his back, Mm. which uh, then has come to light at the end during the reign of Umar, Radiallahu anhu, when they conquer the fashion, Umar called Suraka, he said, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has promised to you to wear the, the crown of the, uh, what do you call him? The, the, of the emperor. Of the emperor. Mm. Um, uh, see it, and you take it. So 
what I'm saying here is that uh, Allah Taala has instructed him to refel evil with good, mm -hmm. as the result of which those people who you think they are enemy because of the kindness and magnanimity you show to them, they will turn to be your your friends, mm -hmm. your closest friends. Mm -hmm. Subhanallah. So here we have Soraka, who was uh, uh, a hunter, bounty hunter. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, ready to be, you know, turned into an assassin, mm -hmm. uh, tracked down the prophet, mm -hmm. finally found him. Mm -hmm. uh, but then out of Allah's will, uh, miraculously, mm -hmm. some kind of a quicksand just started mm -hmm. to sink his animal. Sink his animal. Um, he could see he was about to perish. Mm -hmm. um, he asked the Prophet wasallam for help. And I mean, in the end, he was helped. The simple thing would be for the prophet to just let him perish. Mm -hmm. um, but to help somebody who actually came to try and kill you. Uh, and this person eventually actually helped in diverting uh, a lot of harm, eventually became a Muslim, eventually uh, played a critical role mm. in supporting Islam during the time of uh, Umar. Uh, Umar. Mm. Uh, and I think at the same time mm. that in that context, you're escaping from Makkah, but Allah has given you a vision oh. that a time will come where you would actually defeat the Bashes. oppressive superpower of the time, Persia. Um, you know, that's, that's such a gift on one sense, but the level of faith mm. that in that situation you can even be saying things like that, a little like mm. his optimism about the youth of Ta'if uh, that we discussed earlier. Mm. Um, could you share more support? for uh, this magnanimity from the text and what lessons can we pick from that? Yeah, yeah, there are many from the Quran. Say, verily, the hour is coming, so forgive and show kindness to the fearful. One of the texts from the Quran. Another one, uh, the one we keep mentioning, which is very, uh, that it for ability here, Hassan. And Allah uh, dina yinfi kuna fisarai. Allah has praised those who spent in the sake of Allah. Fisarai, wadarai. Walkazimina lagida. Walkazimina lagida. Those who, who forgive and uh, show kindness. Then he say, Well, I fina ananas. Allah loves those people who do goods, who show goods to others. And there are many texts in the Quran. Quran is full of this. It is full of this text. Mm -hmm. And from the hadith also, Musnad uh, Musnad Ahmad Abdullah bin Amr also narrated that Messenger uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was often on a few feet. He said, Rahimuna Yarhamukum Rahman. Mm -hmm. Those who show mercy and kindness, Allah also will forgive and show mercy on them. So, there are some of the, what we learn from the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, just justification of the, the bas, Umar Arsal Naka Illa, it's all his lifestyle. All the people around him, they love him much because of the, the 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 the, the virtue of kindness, forgiveness, tolerance, and perseverance. Yeah. What would you add to implications? Alhamdulillah, we we are just re-emphasizing mm. the fact that the prophet continued throughout his life to yes, demonstrate, you know, kindness, mercy, mm -hmm. um, you know, at the height of provocation, at the mm -hmm. height of in a humiliation mm. and not minding the fact that the prophet demonstrated showed all this when the opposite mm. should have been the case mm. so he showed mercy when it should be ruthless mm. he showed kindness mm. when it should also be ruthless so despite the fact that you know at at, at a later period he had every power he had he had the might he had everything those who had once wronged him mm. and there were justifications 
for punishing them. Mm. He decided to forgive. To, to forgive mm. and to, to be merciful to, to them. Mm. So it's an indication that you are not exp you are not uh, in Islam, you are not supposed to be you are not expected rather to when you are in the position of authority rather, you are not expected to show ruthlessness mm -hmm. except in the defense of the society. Mm -hmm. Except yeah. in the defense of the state. I, 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 uh -huh. But if it were to be For you know or at the personal yeah. level, at an mm -hmm. individual level, not mm -hmm. at the state or communal level, mm -hmm. you are not expected to show that. But at the personal level, you are expected to demonstrate the height mm -hmm. of magnanimity, the height of one, the spirit of forgiveness and the um, what they call it, the spirit of kindness. And that is also to lend credence to to lend credence to the fact that those of us as Muslims who still believe that uh, you know, Prophet was such an individual whom some would refer to as um, being wicked, mm -hmm. being harsh, being, uh, being this and that. And these are historical facts, you know, with the support from the Quran, from the books of Hadith, and from the classical works of the great scholars of Islam, emphasizing that all the bad attributes, all the bad features or characteristics that we are presenting to describe the personality of the prophet, the prophet was actually the opposite of those bad characters. Mm, in addition to that, after the conquest of Mecca, when the Prophet ﷺ forgave all the the Meccans, with the exception of a few individuals that who were so pronounced in terms of their atrocity, like Sulazatu bin Usal, mm. uh, gave the order wherever he saw Sulazatu bin Usal, because he had been terrorizing the Sahaba, the companion of the Prophet ﷺ, when he was caught and brought into the mocks of the Prophet, he tied in the mocks. The first things the Prophet uh, told him, what do you expect from me? He said, whatever you did is justifiable because I am the one who wronged you. Then he smiled at the Sulala and asked the companion around to feed him. The following day, he did the same thing. Then he forgave him. By forgiving him, after he returned back to his uh, tribe, he said, I have not, I have never seen this type of person. Well, he returned back and joined Islam. Mm. And uh, so what I'm saying is that uh, as a leader, as a leader, when you forgive and overlook wrongdoers, you are definitely doing a very good service to the, to the community, to the people you, you rule. But when it is an uh, issue to do with the other people, as a leader, you must be calm strong enough to make sure justice prevail. That's what the Prophet Sallallahu did on his own. He overlook and forgive. But when it is uh, relating to one another, that he doesn't, he was very serious and uh, very strong enough to, to help the weak ones. Mm. Another point, if I may, please, is that the Prophet did not only pardon, mm. he did not only forgive, mm. he also ensured that he walked the talk of the Quran, mm. that it the far let he hear Ahsan, he should repel evil with good. good. So, yeah. Soraka good bin Malik came mm. to assassinate him, mm. to kill him. Forgive him. He did not only pardon him, mm. he did not only forgive him, mm. he also ensured that Soraka did not perish. Mm. So, and that is how. Another thing. That exactly. exactly. So, that's exactly yeah, yeah. how to repel yeah. evil with good. So, mm. So pardon is one thing. Mm. That is on the one side. And to go, yes, so now yeah. do good to those you should ordinarily punish, punish mm. is another thing. Exactly. And the two were demonstrated by the Prophet at, at, at the same time. At the same time. Only people of great mind do this. Allah, mm. you, not ordinary people do that. But that's what we are called to. Mm. Uh, to love your enemy. Mm. To be forgiving. Mm. Uh, as you said, um, you stand firm with justice mm. when other people are being hurt. Hot. Yeah, you're mm. not the victim, so you can't say I've forgiven. It's mm. not no. for you to forgive. Mm. That will be that'll cruelty be mm. to victims. Mm. So when others are the victims, mm. then you stand for justice. Mm. Um, and you are firm. Uh, but you make sure it's justice that's done. You are never, you know, uh, you, you never allow more harm to be done to the perpetrator of mm. injustice mm. than they did. So it should be equitable mm, uh, exactly. retribution. Yeah. But if the victim decides to forgive, mm. or you're the victim, 
uh, then forgiveness is what is actually encouraged. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we find from the Sunnah of the Prophet is here we are over a thousand four hundred years later and throughout history, this type of act is being brought forward as something that should inspire us mm -hmm. to do the same mm. or do something that is halfway. You know, most of us don't have enemies that are ready to kill you. Like most of us, we don't have, like, if that's what an enemy is, uh, you know, like most of us don't have half enemies. We don't even have people who have 10% of the kind of hatred that some would have that would actually want to go and kill for most of us. Uh, but even if you do have that, this was the example of the Prophet, how mm. much less or how much more if what you are facing is somebody who did what's equivalent to nearly nothing compared yeah. to uh, somebody who actually wants to assassinate. Mm. Um, here we look at the pain that the Prophet went through mm. in Ta'if uh, and in the hands of the Quraysh, mm. um, the threat of people who wanted to kill you, mm. of hypocrites, of mm. this and that. Mm. We look at that pain itself as being, in a way, an asset mm. that qualifies you now to walk the talk. Let's see what you do when you have that type of pain. Are you like everybody else who would rather just retaliate mm. and go for justice? It's a virtue. Or are you the person who would look at your pain as a test of your own spiritual strength mm. and go a step further to not just forgive, as you've said, but to actually do good to the person who caused pain. Um, and in the case of Suraga, mm. um, what's interesting is that after the Qadisiyah and the, the battle the with the Persians uh, and Umar being Caliph, mm. recalls that the Prophet actually said, Prophecy. this person will one day wear the crown. Mm. Uh, so the Prophet didn't just keep it between himself and Suraka, mm -hmm. um, that Umar knew about it, others knew about mm. it, and when it came, go and fulfill that prophecy. Uh, and, you know, you, you can feel the honor that Suraka um, has of being well, told by the Caliph, you know what, yeah, this was something between you and the exactly, Prophet Muhammad, yeah, he I promised mean, it has mm. come to pass and uh, <laughs> let's see it happen. Uh, so I think, uh, as you've put it also, this always trying to emulate the Prophet as the Quran so, so teaches us mm. to learn to forgive. And if you can do more than that, good, uh, do good to those who have hurt you. Uh, and we see forgiveness actually as a very powerful instrument in the hands of the victim, a powerful instrument uh, of change, of peace building. Because if you who has been hurt can forgive, if you who has gone through more pain, a greater threat can forgive, then how easier it should be for others. Mm -hmm. You find in you know, our environment today, um, uh, people who have gone through difficulties uh, in South Africa, in Rwanda, in India, in uh, Pakistan, Nigeria. in Nigeria, is those who have lost family members, those who have the, the you know, if there's anybody who should be calling for justice, mm -hmm. it's these people. And yet, they are the ones calling for forgiveness. They, they make it difficult for you to sustain your anger and ha hatred when they become embodiments. Um, of forgiveness uh, and hope in the mm. you know the good side of humanity. I want to conclude one point. Yes, uh, you see, the Prophet Sallallahu uh, was guided divinely looking at the text, and he lived, he practiced, and he encouraged his people to be to emulate him to do that. Uh, Aisha radiallahu anha she was ever asked him if I am granted the chance to witness the day of uh, Laylatul Qadr. Mm. What's the best prayer should I do? He say, Allahumma inna ka'afun, tibul afu fa'afwani. That the name afu, that beautiful name afu means to forgive, forget, and do good. Not only forgive him, but mm. after I forgive, you do mm. go extra mile mm. to do good. So he, he encouraged his, uh, I mean, he encouraged the ummah also to be what? Uh, afu. Mm. As Allah is Afu, 
he, he want he loves people who are awful for others that you forgive when you are offended you forgive and you go extra to do something for uh, at least not to affect the mind but at least to make sure that the person who offended you he, he feels comfortable mm -hmm. because when you offended me and uh, i say okay no problem I, I forgive you so at the same time you will not feel comfortable to walk free with me yes, true. but if i go little bit and do something good to you you will never forget mm -hmm. and it become Thank you so much. Jazakumullah Hayran. I like that ending, uh, reminding us of that beautiful dua that Allah is afu. Uh, he is forgiving in the magnanimous sense of the term, but also to hibbul afwa. You know, you like it. He uh, likes it. Uh, and something that we should also emulate mm. in our own capacities. Mm. Uh, Jazakumullah Hayran, thank you very much for the okay. contributions. Okay. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Mm.